Textual Builder Supply is pleased to present you with this recording of the technical question that is listed in the title of this video. This call may be monitored and recorded for quality assurance. You know, the Steel Door Institute, steeldoor.org, I've realized as I was looking for this, which took me far too long, they have just a ton of stuff on here that we should be not every week going over, but just their tech. So, you know, when people sign up for these $2,000, $4,000 classes, all that these people are doing is reading to you from freely available published documents, documents by the industry organizations, the national organizations. And, um, you know, so the technical data series is really important in the sense of you read it once and then you're like, oh, yeah, no, I know about that, but what was it exactly? And then you just go back and refer to it. So, okay. you know, basic fire door, fire door frame, transom side light frame, and window requirements. Yeah, if you sell doors, you should probably be familiar with basic fire door requirements. The one that I push to people most often, often is installation, installation troubleshooting because, hey, my door's got too much of a gap. You know, what do I do? Well, okay. I mean, you can sign up for this $2,000 class, and all they're going to do is read to you from this, from this manual. Hmm. Um, so um, we okay. should methodically go through everything on here and work our way through every drop down, every every possible drop down, because it's all uh, good stuff to talk about. Um, codes and standards, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can refer to this stuff, I suppose. But um, you know, the ANSI documents. I mean, you're gonna not that we see them a lot, but in the construction documents, the governing do governing documents of any construction project, they're gonna refer to this stuff. You know, must comply mm -hmm. with. You know, ANSI A250.6, recommended practice for hardware reinforcing. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. that's being referred to, you know, what should happen. And it's not only the Steel Door Institute, but it's also NAM and, and HAMA as well. These are other, the other organizations that, uh, regarding doors. You know, would you really think about them specifying the thread count in a reinforcement? Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, they awesome. do. So... Um, What's we when we talk on the phone, we're always throwing around these terms really, really fast and loose, and they're all really, really important. Um, so, where do you want to start? Let's start at the bottom. Face. The face. Oh. Sure. So, yeah. when you look at um, When you look at um, a hollow metal frame in elevation, so in typical, you know, in, in a set of blueprints for a house, you're going to have three really important um, perspectives. And that is the elevation, it is the plan view, and it is the um, right side view. Uh, so you're always going to have, and I know that stuff because I took drafting in high school. Um, so when we look at a profile, if you've not hit subscribe yet, we would very much appreciate if you did, and hopefully you're enjoying this video. Now let's get back to it. This is the profile of anyone's head, okay? So the term face is also referred to as the profile. What profile do you want? So all that really means is what dimension do you want here? Two inch is the standard, but it doesn't have to be two inch. An aluminum storefront, that face or the profile, if someone says to you, I want a two inch profile frame, yep, that's what they mean. They mean the profile of, you know, of if you're looking at this frame in that same sort of orientation as we were with uh, Benjamin Franklin, that's definitely right. going to be what you see. So two inches standard for hollow metal in aluminum storefront, it's inch and a half generally, but it can be anything all the way down to whatever minimum um, the manufacturer can actually create because you can get so small here that you can no longer 
get the tooling of the press brake inside of there to create the bend, because these are bent on a press brake. You can mm -hmm. roll form frames if the gauge of the steel is thin enough, but these are put in, they're sheared. This starts out as a flat piece of steel, and they know exactly how wide the flat sheet of steel is to achieve all of this. So mm -hmm. two inches standard, but you might want inch and three quarter. You might want inch and a half. You might want inch and a quarter or one inch, or you might want something greater than two inch but two inches the standard. Why would you want different sizes to accommodate different uh, dimensional requirements of your application? Or sometimes the architect says, nope, I don't want two inch. I want these to look more like aluminum storefront, so let's make them inch and a half. You can do that. But it also does, you know, you have to be mindful of what that dimension is because it could complicate your installation. If you're doing door closers mounted on the face, imagine if this was the header, in, um, installed literally on this face, you got to take into account that you don't have the amount of real estate uh, necessary in all in many instances to get your hardware installed. So the face we we call it the profile. Um, if someone refers to it as a profile, that's because what we're looking at. Okay. We're looking at the profile. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to rabbit, there are two rabbits. There's this one here and this one here. Now, generally, rabbits are going to be. Um, Generally, a rabbit, um, there, there, there is, there are, there are double rabbit frames. Why? Because there are two rabbits, so it's double. It's a double rabbit frame. There are single rabbit frames. Single rabbit frames are actually very common in wood or in residential construction out of wood frames. That's a single rabbit frame where there's only one rabbit. That's your door, by the way. So a single rabbit frame is also very common. But in hollow metal, it's almost always double rabbit, but it can be single rabbit when the client is saying, we want single rabbit, and that's generally a result of a look that they're going for. Their pioneer was, is a manufacturer in, they're now in somewhere in New Jersey, and they, back in the 50s and 60s, those guys made a lot of fancy stuff. Here's a single rabbit frame, but that's not 90 degrees, that angle. So they did a lot of really cool stuff. Usually when I see a single rabbit frame, it's because the jam depth which is not referred to here, is the dimension from the outside here to the outside here. That's how deep the frame is. The jam depth gets so small, like three and a half inch or less, where you can't have a double rabbit frame. It automatically becomes single rabbit because you literally don't have the ability to bend that steel anymore. You can't make it a okay. double rabbit frame. So it has to be, you, you'll, say, you'll say to your hollow metal manufacturer, I need, I need frames that are three and a quarter jam depth, the depth of the frame, the outside here to here. They'll say, fine, we can do it, but it'll be a single rabbit frame because they don't have enough to make this bend. There's not enough depth because the tooling of the press brake is such that they need to have, you know, the, the, the press brake tooling itself, this would be a die set is what we're kind of looking at here. This is what a, the die looks like. So what goes into, let's wait for that to load. Okay, this is a mini press brake. So this is the die set. There's a V in here, and then when you put the steel in here and you push this down, it will bend the material is what it's going to do. Now, the, what, I'm, what I'm driving at is the tooling that's here actually has a dimension. And when you get so small, you can no longer bend that material. Right, okay. That's that's why you'll get into single rabbit frames. Um, so uh, 16 gauge, 14 gauge, 12 gauge frames are, are always made. The steel is first sheared and then it's punched and then it's put into a press brake. You'll punch it for your hardware preps. So there are two rabbits. The rabbit is always going to be 3 16 greater than the door thickness. You don't have to memorize that because you can pull up the technical manual from Seco or Curry's or anyone really, and you'll see that. Now, some manufacturers will make equal rabbit where they're both the same size. Some manufacturers will also make unequal rabbit 
where one is a little bit smaller, and that's generally one and nine sixteenths. Now, the reason that they'll do make unequal rabbit is because in the same sort of profile, you can stick an inch and three quarter thick door in one rabbit or an inch and three eighths door in the other rabbit. Kiwani, a manufacturer that had been in business for several decades, it was all unequal rabbit. Even though they could make them equal rabbit, they, uh, they didn't care. But the standard was unequal rabbit because Kiwani did a lot of uh, work in the, let's say, the Gold Coast, all the way up Lakeshore Drive in Chicago where there's a bunch of mid-rise buildings with steel frames on the interior of these condos that were all hollow core wood doors, but they were inch and three-eighths thick. So that, you know, so Kiwani could easily, without changing their, their tooling, do inch and three-eighths or inch and three-quarter thick doors because their rabbits were unequal. Seco does it. Everybody does it. Um, some manufacturers have equal rabbit as their standard. Doesn't really matter. So that's what the rabbit is. There are two dimensions on here, two, two things to, uh, to know about just quickly. I had already said one. That's the jam depth. That's how deep the frame is, basically from here to here. Really important. Jam the standard is five and three quarter. The depth of a frame can be anything you want, up to whatever the machining limitations are. Down to about two and a, two and five, maybe two and three quarter jam depth all the way up. I mean, the deepest frame I've done has been over 20 inch. And that okay. just is based on application. So jam depth. So J-A-M-B depth. Then the other dimension that's not on there is throat opening. The distance from here oh, yeah. to here. Throat that's opening. Right. Well, that's, throat that's bad to do okay. that. So that's not on there as well. Th throat is generally one inch less than the jam depth, but not always. On a drywall frame, well, forget the term drywall, but there's a particular common type of frame where the throat is seven-eighths less than the jam depth. But it's not always. The important thing to know is when you're doing a job, you have to know what is the jam depth and what is the throat opening. Both of those matter. They don't always equally matter in importance, but you have to know what they are. And if you're not sure, you ask tech support. That leads us to this return. This is the return. In standard frames, that's half inch because jam depth minus throat opening is one inch. Mm, Usually right. divided by two is half inch. Half inch here, half inch here. Drywall frames, drywall frames are used in the Starbucks on the bathrooms and 10 trillion other locations. The back bend return is used in knockdown drywall style frame. A drywall frame is a steel frame. It's just meant to go over partition walls, so we call it drywall frames. The reason that's there is when you slide the frame over the wall, when you have your two studs, drywall, drywall. These are just sheets of 5H drywall. Okay. When you bring your frame, when you bring your frame over the drywall, you need the back bend return here. Otherwise, if you didn't have the back bend return, it would tear the paper face off of the drywall and push it all back. Mm -hmm. So there's okay. always a drywall, there's always a back bend return on drywall frames. If you don't have it and you sell a guy masonry type frames that don't have a back bend return for a drywall. So if you don't have a back bend return, you'll tear the paper. So you'll see drywall frames that have backbend returns. That's normal. Okay. That's that's okay. that's normal to be there. So we've really covered everything except what's referred to as the stop. The stop has two components. They don't call it here, but this is the face of the stop. This is the soffit. Now, what you install, mm. it's important to know because all of this is the stop. That's what your door makes contact with or is stopped from preventing it going in any further. It's the stop. Go look at the frame behind your desk. It's got a stop on it. So you've got the face of the stop and then you've got the soffit. And hardware gets installed in these areas, but it's important to know that 
you know, we were talking yes, we were talking yesterday about that goofy Hager 824S. And mm -hmm. what we were dealing with on that was we were dealing with this and the door was in here. Here's let's assume in that it's single rabbit and that goofy okay. material went in here and then it nailed here. Well, that's the soffit. That's the stop face. So it's really important to be able to say to somebody, yeah, you attach it in the soffit of the frame or you nail it there. Now that's a term that a lot of people aren't going to know, but in our industry, it's the soffit. That's what you call it. So your mm -hmm. Hager 824S material was definitely being installed in the soffit. This is showing it either in a jam, in a jam cross section where this is a hinge or a strike jam. This could also be the header. This could be a right side view. So it'll get nailed into the soffit. But when you look mm -hmm. at stuff like the S88 material from Pemco and you look at this in, these installation instructions, what's really interesting about this material is um, where you install it. So this is going to be installed in the rabbit of the frame. However, you'll install it on the rabbit of the frame provided you're doing the hinge jam or the header, but you see over here on the on the on the jam face alternative positioning hinge jam and strike. You can also install it on the stop face. Mm -hmm. So they refer to all of this collectively as the stop it is you and I are taking it a step further. We're saying right. this part here or this part here is the soffit. This part here is the stop face. I'm calling it right. the stop face. It's the face of the stop. So that's, and, you know, that's... And that a, usually has a dimension to it, right? The actual stop is pretty oh, gotcha. standard. Either, was it half inch or five eighths? I can't remember. So that's really important. It depends on what it is, but typical hollow metal is five eighths, but it could be three quarter, but that's unusual, but you will see it. in residential wood construction that's generally going to be half inch the projection awesome. of the stop so this is half inch unless it's seven sixteenths this is two inch unless it's something else this is inch and fifteen sixteenths and this is either inch and fifteen sixteenths or it's inch and nine sixteenths if it's a double rabbit frame this is almost always five eighths the soffit is jam depth minus rabbit minus rabbit that's really important to know because when you have a coordinator, a coordinator is used to tell one door to prevent the active door from closing ahead of the inactive door. Let's do... It coordinates the order in which they close. That's exactly <laughs> what it does. What's important about the soffit dimension is you have to have to have to know which mounting bracket to use because there are different mounting uh, there are different mounting brackets dependent on your soffit size so if you have a typical five and three quarter frame you're going to use the ab because if you do the math you're going to be at two and a quarter on an equal rabbit frame you got something bigger than that so that's why that's important Soft, uh, jam depth minus rabbit minus rabbit e equals soffit. And yes, you have to be calculating that. You have to be calculating that. A, a mounting bracket is really important because with this coordinator, and the coordinator runs the entire width of the opening, guess what? You can't screw into this, into this uh, coordinator. You can't run screws into it. So if you're going to mount a door closer on a parallel arm bracket, you're going, to, you're going to screw it into the mounting bracket that's here. That's where you drill and tap into to mount your hardware. You run a screw into this, all of a sudden the internal linkages are, are, not going to, are probably not going to work anymore. So that's why the soffit dimension is important. Okay. And so that, that would be the soffit of the header where that would be installed. Yeah, right? this stuff would be in the soffit of the header, but it's also important to know if you were going to be installing a exit device strike 
on a single door and you were going to use a mounting bracket. Here we go. So what happens with these bad boys is on the jam you'll have this weather stripping installed. Well, where are you going to install the strike plate for your rim exit device? See, this is a great example of why you need mounting brackets. Because what the guy did here is he cut his weather stripping to get that PA bracket installed. What he should have done was he should have he should have used different weather stripping that you could drill and tap into, what they call hardware compatible weather stripping. Um, but if you take this idea and you think about a rim exit device, um, you're going to have a strike plate that's going to be in, uh, included with it. I don't know if I'll, this will work out really well. Yeah, so here's a strike plate for a rim exit device. Well, if you install that right down into the soffit, you're going to interrupt the uh, weather stripping. But if you use a mounting bracket such as the zero type of mounting brackets, wherever they were, doesn't matter at this point, I suppose. But you, you need to be aware of, am I going to fit the material onto the soffit? And that's really important when you are dealing with standard frames or smaller frames. If you've got a six, seven, eight and three quarter jam depth, you're good. You've got plenty of real estate. You know, you're good because your jam depth is so big, your soffit's so big. Um, so that is... That's the math on how you know what this is. You don't have to ask. What's your jam depth? What are your rabbit dimensions? Equal or unequal. You do simple subtraction and then you have it. And then again, mm -hmm. almost always 5 eighths, but it could be 3 quarter. And in some UL instances, you have to have 3 quarter stops, meaning it's been tested with higher projection stops. Um, the back bend return, I don't really know what that is, but it's probably 7 sixteenths. Um, not super important, but what's really important is on fire rated frames is that the drywall penetrates into the depth of the frame by at least a half of an inch. So um, knowing these things is what allows you to be able to catch mistakes. I caught a guy yesterday, um, needs 40 mortise locks, and uh, in southwest Florida, and... He said, I, I want all the new trim. I don't need the mortise bodies. I just only need the levers and the escutcheons. Okay, great. He sends me the pictures, and through my research, I, I realize, ah, none of his locks are windstorm rated. So I told the guy, call me. He does, and he says, oh, no, no, they're all windstorm rated. And then I press him, and then it turns out that the door manufacturer provided all of the locks windstorm rated, he, with the condo association, then changed all the mortise bodies only because they didn't like the function. But I could tell based on his photographs that what they did was they took code compliant doors and relegated them to be no longer code compliant. So it was really helpful to leverage my knowledge to look at something like this and say, okay, here's what you're doing. You know, what's... You know, I, I'm dealing with a four and three quarter frame. What mounting bracket do I have to have? It's helpful to know what all of this means so that you can say, well, this is what you need. So that, that's why knowing this, the anatomy of a frame is important. If you've not hit subscribe yet, we would very much appreciate if you did. And hopefully you're enjoying this video. Now let's get back to it. Gotcha. So um, in that example that you said yesterday, uh, where he sent photos and what you said that it was an actual mortise case that had been changed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And what happened? Yeah, so what was the telltale on that? Like, yeah, I'm gonna, was I'm it gonna just obvious? You know, it was a different model. Okay. Yeah. No. 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 He and he denied it in the sense of, and I had to tell him, I'm not <laughs> the windstorm police. I'm not. I'm not the windstorm police. So uh, you know what you do, and I gave him a quote for exactly what he asked for, all new trims, and they want new trims because of what Irma did, not my Aunt Irma, my Uncle Donnie's mm -hmm. wife, what, what Hurricane Irma did to the trim, okay? And they want to replace all the trim. Well, I'm looking at the pictures, and I realize, okay, well, what function is this? Uh-huh, it's got a latch, and it has a deadbolt. But what it doesn't have is the deadlocking tab, as you and I have gone over, 
what a deadlocking tab mm -hmm. is on a latch bolt. And I quickly realized that the I, through my research, I discovered that the only two functions of Hager mortise locks that are windstorm rated are the 53 and the 81 function. And both of those functions have a deadlocking tab. What he must have is a corridor function of 56, but he don't have a deadlocking tab. Only the 81 and the 53 have it. And further investigation tells us, oh, it's in the price list, tells us that the only way to get windstorm ratings is to have a 53 or a 81 function. And let's just get there. Ah, and here it is. That's one nice thing about Edge is it saves where you were last. Um, okay, okay, okay. For severe windstorm rating, add 4968 to the list. It must be a 53 or an 81 function only. And we've already discovered that 53 and 81 functions have deadlocking tabs. And nowhere here do you see a deadlocking tab. We know it's Hager. Well, we believe it's Hager because it says Hager, but it's not windstorm rated. So it turns so, out that him and his him and the condo association screwed the pooch. Take if if any of these doors had blown open, loss of life. You can guarantee the lawyers are going to be looking at what was keeping those locks, those doors secured. And if they were good lawyers, they would have found that none of these were windstorm rated. Interesting. Interesting. Doesn't so happen. To 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 that doesn't seem like it's expensive. Did they they bought new mortise cassettes to just because they didn't like. They didn't like, like the. It seems like a lot more money. See, okay. Well, they they bought all new mortise lock bodies, and the reason they did is because they had they literally had the fifty three function originally. Their door supplier on the east coast of Florida provided them per code. Their assemblies were windstorm rated, legitimate, code compliant. I's dotted, T's crossed. Turns out that people were going out, leaving themselves locked out. So with the function they went to, you have to either manually throw the thumb turn or you have to put the key in to lock it. All of this down here is just a passage set. The only way to secure mm -hmm. this is by throwing that bolt. So they could no longer leave themselves. They go out to the balcony. They take their trash out. The door closes because it's windy. You're locked out. They changed all of that, rendering themselves. Now, what should have happened was the door supplier should have said to the contractor, and, oh, by the way, happy to take your money, but you're no longer code compliant. That was, right. you know, th now that's the fact that they didn't say that tells me that, okay, well, you'd have to be, you know, Gandalf the White, not Gandalf the Gray, to know some of this stuff. you got to be elevated. Uh, you got to be down the road a few years in hardware to really pick that up. So it's not like it's their fault that they didn't tell them, but they didn't tell them because they didn't know, or they were being knowingly negligent. That's right. not serving the customer. The point, how this ties to here is knowing the definition allows you to make the proper decisions and to navigate your client in their best interest. Because, Corey, it's not your money. Right. It's the owner's money. They get to decide. Now, is that at times counter to your best interests? Yes, of course. You're in sales. I'm in sales. Customer, you know, I, I want you to spend money. That, that runs counter to giving them the right advice. But at the end of the day, we're obligated to what's best for the person that writes the check. Right. And, and so knowledge of this stuff helps guide you to that. Oh, um, I want I want four inch jam depth frames and I want coordinators and I got parallel arm bracket door closers. What are you gonna do? Sell them a list of materials just because he asked for that? Or are you gonna say, oh, and by the way, we gotta talk about, we can't proceed until we sort out the problem. Your jam depth is too small. Or, no, 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 your bracket, your C bracket, your 2901C bracket that you asked for is the wrong bracket, and you need mm -hmm. to spend less money because you need the AB bracket because your jam depth is 4-inch. You need the smaller bracket. Because what will happen is you'll have 10 openings on a job, and they copy-paste, and the one they copy-pasted from was a 6-and-3-quarter jam depth with the, with the C bracket. 
So knowing the definitions allows you to prevent mistakes because let's face it, if you're the distributor and there's a mistake, you're not getting paid whether or not it was your mistake, but your ability will allow you to, you know, avoid the bull's horns when you're shaking the red cape in front of them. Right. You know, that's, that's the point of why this is important. Because I'm dropping mm-hmm. those terms, stop it, stop face. You need to be able to go back and say, ah, what was he talking about? What is the anatomy of the frame that draws me to that area? And there's nothing, I mean, the only other thing I had said it quickly, 16 gauge is standard. You can do 14 and 12 gauge. You can also do 18 gauge on frames, but that's atypical. 16 is the standard. Your frame gauge is only always the next size thicker than your door as a rule of thumb. 18 gauge doors, 16 gauge frames. 16 gauge doors, 14 gauge frames. So fantastic. And that, that circles back to uh, a note from a month or so ago. I was just about to ask, and aren't the frames always one gauge larger than the actual door? So fantastic. One, one, yeah, the next larger size. You know, we in our industry we deal with 20, 18, 16, 14, and 12. Um, you won't get. Um, 12 gauge doors, even though they can be made, but they're really not considered hollow metal anymore. You'd have a 14 gauge door. That's a massive, massive mm-hmm. door. A 12 gauge gotcha. frame, when you pick it up, you'll say, holy cow. And you'll <laughs> you'll do ballistic rated material uh, where it'll stop a smaller handgun, and it's just common hollow metal. That's just how thick the steel is. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. And okay. when you get into that thicker stuff, you know, the detail the resolution, so to speak, of your bends will be very different because of how thick that steel is. The resolution or the precision or how tight that corner is, it's got everything to do with the thickness of the steel. I don't think you're going to get back bend returns on a 12-gauge frame because they just right. can't bend the steel. It's too thick. Right. Too thick <laughs> you and should, too small bend. You should try to find, you should, as I had said, next time you're in L.A., um, Go to, go to ASA's service center there in Ontario and say, show me the press break. And they'll show you a guy running it. It'll be, it'll be fascinating to see how they're doing it and how they bend to frames. You'll want to call them and say, what day are you bending frames? That's what I want to come see. It's really okay, cool. The cool. machine's got CNC, uh, digital CNC backstops on it. So you're kind of, you have to be, you have to be a, a machine operator, but the machine's doing a lot of the thinking once you tell it what to do. So anyway, so I would like for you to, uh, of your own recognizance, keep a running draft email of SDI and where we are in the greater world of SDI. And let's work through all of it. It'll be dry if that's all we do every week. So, but for sure, once a month or every other week, let's revisit the hollow metal basics because hollow metal is inherently tied to hardware. Oh yeah. I mean, everything we're going over, it's like, this is, the stuff to help me get around it, you know, all the hard work is it's where the stuff attaches, all the terms I need to know. So, yeah, I, I like it. One on, one off, you know, so switch to hardware and then go back to, you know, anatomy of a, a door frame, all, all the good stuff. So, yeah. sounds good to me. All right, my man. Thanks for calling. Appreciate you. Take care. Bye bye. Architectural Builder Supply hopes you have enjoyed this program. Please click thumbs up, please subscribe, and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.